Amen. Well, please remain standing for the reading of God's Word this evening. We will continue in our series in 1 Samuel, and we will read together 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 12 to 22. Hear now the reading of God's holy Word. A man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with dirt on his head. When he arrived, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road watching for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the sound of the outcry, he said, what is this uproar? Then the man hurried and came and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old and his eyes were set so that he could not see. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, how did it go, my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for the man was old and heavy. He had judged Israel forty years. Now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant, about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed and gave birth, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women attending her said to her, do not be afraid, for you have borne a son. But she did not answer or pay attention. And she named the child Ichabod saying, the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God had been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord shall stand forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. We thank you, O God, that you would speak and your servants might hear. And so help us, O Lord, even this night, that our ears would be unstopped, our hearts opened, and we would long for Jesus, we ask in his name, amen. You may be seated. If you were with us for our Reformation Conference, we had the Reverend Dr. Ligon Duncan come and teach on Saturday and then also preach on Sunday. And he was speaking on Calvin and specifically the necessity of reforming the church. And he was using a work of Calvin's called The Necessity of Reforming the Church. And one of the implications and applications he was making, if you remember on Saturday, is this. He said, worship creates disciples. He said, worship creates disciples. We become what we worship. And then he added a bit of a tagline there. It wasn't simply, we become what we worship. He also went as far as to say is, we become like how we worship. That something about worship changes and transforms us for good or for ill, depending on the object. And so when we speak of worship, we've talked about it and perhaps even used this phrase before, we're mentioning the worth-ship of something. That which is... Well, it's a deep desire and a longing of your heart, of your, of your life. It deserves and it draws out praise. It's glorious, we might say. It's great. It's so large, so heavy, it requires our affection, our loyalty. So what is that glory for you? What glory matters to you? What draws out those affections, that loyalty, those desires? Or as a former pastor of mine would say, what are you thinking when you're not thinking at all? What consumes your thoughts when nothing is being put before you? And so I want to talk about this idea of glory. That's what our text is about tonight. 
Where is the glory? And so we'll look at it in two points. There's misplaced glory, and we can see it in verses 12 to 18. And where is the glory? Verses 19 to 22. Well, as we pick up our text and we look in verse 12, I think we need to be reminded of something. You and myself as the reader, we have information that the city of Shiloh does not. We have the first part of 1 Samuel 4. We know what has happened in the battle. We know about Hophni and Phinehas. We know that Israel has been defeated multiple times, that there has been a great slaughter as we read. But Shiloh, the city, has no idea. They are now receiving, as it were, the breaking news. Here is the live update in which they understand what has taken place. And this update is difficult, isn't it? But the details of the update are very significant. Look at how it begins. A man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with dirt on his head. You've got a man from Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. He has escaped. He's returning from the battle. And it's interesting, isn't it, that that's the detail we begin with. A man from Benjamin The hope of Israel is resting upon a Benjaminite. And it's a bit ironic because in a few chapters, Israel is going to put their hope again in a Benjaminite. And the report's not going to look much different. That is King Saul, if you know anything about him. And so here comes this man from Benjamin. And as he gets close to the city, he's going to speak And you could say he speaks both in words and what he's wearing. His clothes will tell you something. He's ran some 20 miles and he wasn't wearing his fancy Nikes or any of the female clothing. The Nike is the only thing I could think of for the guys. What What is he doing? He's trekked through the woods as it were. And his clothes are torn. They're ripped He's got dirt all over his face and on his head. He wears the position of the report. It's not been a good day. Just a sight of him would say they've lost. He's running towards the city to inform them. And yet there's a bit of a break for a moment. We get a report, a a bit of a description about Eli. It's just a partial one, but there's a difference here, is there not? When he arrived, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road watching. That should catch our attention. The last time we remember Eli in a seat, he was in the temple of the Lord. And he is nowhere close to the temple of the Lord. He is sitting by the roadside on some seat. And his heart is trembling. How often do narratives Give us the inner focus of what's going on. Eli, you've heard nothing. And in fact, we'll see momentarily, you have seen nothing. Why is your heart trembling? Is it perhaps because he's remembering the prophecy that had already been made? Due to your leadership and that of your sons, they will die And so will your family line. What does Eli know that no one else seems to know? Why is he troubling? Why is he trembling at the ark of God? Could it be because it's a pattern that has so frequently marked Eli's life? He knows the right thing to do, but in fact, he does the opposite. He knew that his sons had been in gross sin. It was the talk of the town, and he did nothing. He just simply asked them about it. He knew what was right, but he looked the other way. Well, how could that have been the case now? The people of God have summoned the ark of God. They have taken it outside of the holy place. And he would know you should never do such a thing. And yet he says, nothing. And there goes the ark of God against the will of God, as it were, into battle. And Eli just watches it go. And so here comes this man from Benjamin running in and he gives a report and the city is in uproar. It it cries out. 
And Eli wants to know what's happened. What's going on? And so he calls the man to come and speak to him. And there's nothing positive, is there, about his report? You can see it. It begins in verse 16. Here he is. Uh, I am he who has come from the battle. I, I fled from the battle today. That, that's the beginning of the report. And Eli's response is, how did it go, my son? That was not meant to be some kind of term of endearment. That is, spit it out, boy. We need to hear what's going on. Why is everyone so upset? I need to know immediately. And the report goes something like this. I fled from battle. Israel has lost to the Philistines. They've been slaughtered. Hophni and Phinehas have died. And up to this point, there ought to be no surprise. That had been a part of the judgment of God and that had been prophesied. Eli should have anticipated and perhaps expected that. And so I don't think that's the writer's punchline. I think the punchline comes after that. He says in verse 17 at the very end, and the ark of God has been captured. It's a very blunt and blatant statement to Eli. He is immediately being confronted with the full reality of his actions. Yes, he had the prophecy about what was going to happen to his family line. He knew nothing about what would happen to the nation of Israel. He was not given any information of that. Eli is having to look in the mirror and wrestle with this idea that sin is never private. Your actions, sin always affects someone else. And we can try and say, but I, I did it behind closed doors. Nobody knew, no one heard. But it always finds its way out, doesn't it? Because sin is never satisfied by simply one action. It always tries to bring about new practices or new patterns or even new attitudes. And so at times, our sin finds its way out in how we talk to someone or how we treat someone. And it might not even be directly tied to the specific sin in which you're thinking of. But we can be clear, sin is never private. It's never left alone. It's always at work within us. And Eli is being told, your sin has affected the entire nation of Israel. What you did has affected everybody. And so what happens? Well, the writer tells us, doesn't he? Eli dies but he tells of his death in great detail. He doesn't just simply say, Eli died. He wants to give us the detail, and I think he does so for a reason. I think he's trying to teach us something. Eli was sitting in a chair. What happens to Eli, a part of his death? He is literally dethroned. He falls out of a seat. The one who is meant to be the seat, the leader of Israel, has now just fallen out. He is no longer on the throne, you might say. And maybe you thought it was a bit humorous. If the word of God is true and it's final and it's forever, who wants their weight to be calculated in the scriptures? Eli is old, he's blind, and what do we learn about him? He's heavy. He weighs too much. And you thought, well, you didn't really have to have such a low blow there. I think what they're trying to say is something quite profound about Eli, do you remember a few chapters earlier? 1 Samuel chapter 2, the three-pronged fork, the stab and grab. They were making sacrifices. Hophni and Phinehas said, just take what you want. And if they're not giving what we want, force it. Go poke the meat and take whatever you want, whatever we want. And do you remember what they took? They took the fat portions. They took the portions that were meant to be the sacrifice to the Lord, for the Lord. Instead of giving glory to God, they satisfied themselves. And some of you perhaps already know this. Do you know what the Hebrew word is for glory? It's kavod. And did you know the word heavy here? It's the verb form of kavod. 
It's as if the writer is simply saying the glory of man is being found around his waist. He decided not to give glory to God. He wanted to wear it for himself and so much so it killed him. He was not the one who was to be the glorified one. He was to be the one to give glory and therefore it's a physical picture of a spirit. Spiritual reasons is being withdrawn. He's leaving. The one who had brought them out, who had redeemed them, who had said, I'll be with you, is now leaving due to their false worship. And Eli gets a short obituary. He judged Israel 40 years. It's that reminder of the refrain we saw in Judges. So and so judged Israel for so many years. So and so judged Israel for so many years. But there is a difference, you see. There is no other place in all of Scripture in which you will read that Eli is a judge. Judges in the book of Judges were appointed by God. And we never find out in 1 Samuel that God appoints Eli as judge. It's as if the writer is simply trying to say, this is not the leader that Israel so needed. Yes, he was the leader. Yes, he was the judge. He's not the one you should have been looking for. He's not the one you should have been longing for. For. And so we could say, well, how did he get there? What happened? How could we have this end result? The answer? Well, I don't know. We don't know. We're not given a detail. Was there a person? Was there an event? Was there a relationship? We, we have no idea how he got here. But what we can say is it happened the same way it happens for you and for me. It's when we decide to make the one small compromise. It's when we decide to make the one small decision thinking it won't affect anyone or anything. I think that's Paul's point. Isn't that what he speaks about? Whatever one sows, he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life. It is the Lord's day, and it is the Lord's day evening, and this is a powerful reminder to all who are here, especially young people and to parents of little children. It's hard, isn't it? It's been a long day. It's hard to get them back. Some of them are hungry even now. I might be one of them. It's hard. It's not easy. They're tired. You didn't get everything finished. You're trying to make plans for the week. Not everything has been put together. And yet, what are you doing? You're doing the hard work of building regular Sabbath habits for your life and for theirs. It's the sowing of the Spirit. It's saying, I trust the means of grace that God, you will bless such an effort that we will come, even when it's hard, even when we don't feel like it, we will come and we trust you. Work in the lives of our children. Work in the lives of your people. Because you remember that saying, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a lifestyle. Sow a lifestyle, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. You know, if that's true, if there's any truth in that statement, what does it tell us? It tells us that our activities our character, it, it flows directly out of what we believe. We've said it before. It's a powerful question that we often ask. We asked it this morning. Do you remember it? Christian, what do you believe? It's this confession of faith, yes. And it is a confession that we make with our words, but we confess such words with our lives. Often it's our lives that are making a louder confession than even that of our words. And so it's a hard question. 
What do our lives confess about the glory of God? Or have we misplaced it for the glory of man? There's a misplaced glory. And then secondly, where is the glory? We hear of Eli's death and his obituary, and then we're introduced to a character for a few verses only. We know nothing of her name. It's Eli's daughter-in-law. It's Phineas's wife. We don't know anything else about her. Other than that, she is Phineas's wife, and she is pregnant. She's going to bear a son. Even as we heard in the pastoral prayer, and, and some of you have already said it, what a moment of joy when children are born. It is meant to be intense joy. When someone says or sends you a text with a picture, here is our new baby, girl or boy. No one says, sorry, good luck. No, it's, it's heart emojis and, and all the other weird emojis and congratulations and, and praise the Lord. Why? It's, it's incredible. It's a blessing. Should we have thought any differently here? Here she is pregnant. This moment of joy, and did you see any joy there? Not in the least. In fact, I think the writer is intentionally trying to draw your attention and mine back to something else. When we read about birth narratives in the scripture, they are moments of joy. There's only two that I know of in which we, remind, uh, we are reminded of the pain that comes in childbirth. This one and the curse that God gave Eve in Genesis chapter three. And he says, you will experience pain in childbirth, not because I don't like you. This is a part of the judgment against sin. And I think that's what the writer is saying here is there isn't a moment of joy here. This is a picture of judgment. This is a picture of sin. It is entirely connected with such a reality. And so these women she is going to give birth. It's clear she dies and they, they draw around her. They gather around her and they're trying to encourage her. But you're having a baby boy. Here he is. He's made it. This moment of joy seems to be that of grief and she pays them no attention. I don't think it's because she's in so much pain she can't think for herself. No, I think it's what she is recognizing because she names her son is there's something far greater than the physical pain I've just experienced. It's the spiritual reality of what has taken place. It's not so much that my husband has died, although that is bad. It's not so much that my father-in-law has died, although that is bad. What do we read most prominent in her confession? It's the ark of God has been captured she seems to have a, a realization of the spiritual condition by which the people of God are in. Dale Ralph Davis actually says of her that she teaches more theology in her death than the whole of Phineas's life. She is describing the difficult reality of what God's people deserve due to their sin. And she names her son Ichabod saying the glory has departed. You know, that's what Ichabod means. No glory. Or where is the glory? And you can imagine how it would have been to meet him. His very presence, when he introduces himself, would have had to bring about a question. What did you say your name was? Ichabod? Where's the glory? What has happened? Who would have named you that way? You remember they named their children with purposes, not because the name sounded nice, although I'm not saying that's a wrong reason to name your child that, but they named them with a vision, with a purpose, with something that would characterize their life or perhaps even the people of God. And she says, my son's name is Ichabod. You meet him and you immediately are confronted. The glory of God is gone. She hears that the ark has been captured and we're unsure does she seem to think the ark has been captured and so the glory of God is gone? And now Yahweh is in control of the Philistines. They can do as they please. We didn't do it right and so he left and he chose somebody else. Are the Philistines stronger than God? Can God not even control this? 
You know the answer is, no, that's not the case. But this is her understanding of the reality. And there's something about what she is describing that is right. The glory of God did depart, but she is also wrong. The glory of God didn't depart because the ark was captured. The glory of God left because the people of God were unfaithful. You know, there was a, a, a woman who came, I think, a few weeks ago and, and asked me this question about 1 Samuel chapter 4. When Hophni and Phinehas walked into the Holy of Holies and took out the Ark of the Covenant and took it into battle, it was a great question. She said, how did they do that? How could they have gotten in there? Wasn't that the place in which priests had to wear bells because it was the holiness of God? Weren't they there only when they were supposed to be there? And if not, they would have died? I said, I said yes, that's, that's true. So she pushed and said, well, then how did they do it? And I said, if I'm honest with you, I can't answer definitively, but I think our text the following week will be insightful. I think the glory of God had already left. And you watched what took place. They were slaughtered on the battlefield. Phineas' wife was right, but she was wrong. It was just a symbol. It was not the cause. The glory of God is not tied to a box. The glory of God is far greater than that because I think it's a powerful punch for the people of God, isn't it? The last 40 years, Eli has been the leader and he's dead and the ark is gone. And so you ask, where is the glory? And it's depending on how you answer that question. If the glory of God or if the glory that you trust in is placed in man, well then in a word, it's over there on the side of the street, dead. But the glory of God is still there very much within himself. But it's a dark time in Israel. God has seemingly left. Where is he? Where is he gone? It reminds us of what we just celebrated. It's that Reformation phrase. Post tenebras, lux, after darkness, light. What were they saying? It was, a, it was a returning to truth. Your word is truth. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a, it's a reforming. It's a going back. Or often, as it said, it's reforming back, not a revolt to. They weren't trying to create a fight. They weren't trying to stoke the fire. They were trying to say, we need to return to the word of God. That is where the light of the glory of God is. Where has God gone? Where is the glory? Well, you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you live in the shadow of the cross. You live on the other side of it. And he has said, I have given you my glory. You can find it in my word. I will teach you where the glory of God is, what the glory of God is, who the glory of God is. You can believe it. You can believe him. Because what do we learn in the word of God? He is a covenant-making God, a promise-making one that says, I will be your God. You will be my people. He offered that to Israel, and he offers you the same. It's one faithful promise that I will be your God, and you will be my people. What does he say? I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. What does Jesus say at the very end, right before his ascension? I am with you to the very end of the age. And when you and I are tempted, even today, to doubt such a thing, you recited some of it earlier. What can separate us? Nothing. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Don't you wish you were there when Paul penned that chapter? What was Paul's face saying when he was understanding how permanent the love of God is for those in Christ Jesus. This little boy named Ichabod, he symbolizes the time in which they lived. Unfortunately, it's not gonna be the last time that they've ha they're gonna have to deal with something like this. Ezekiel chapter 10 will give another reference there, it's not the glory of God leaving a box. He's leaving the temple. 
And what's going to happen? The people of God are going to be oppressed and they're going to be brought under captivity first by the Assyrians and then finally by the Babylonians. Israel seems to understand that there is something special about God's presence. And they seem to be coming more and more clear when God's presence leaves, this is never a good thing. Even David confessed such a thing. Do you remember that? Do not cast me away from your presence. Stay with me. Be here with me. Where is the glory? What brings the departing of God and his glory? It's a very simple answer. When we give glory to other things, when we decide other things are worthy of our worship, that was what Dr. Duncan was talking about in his reference to Calvin, criticizing the Catholic Church, saying, these are just words of man. Scripture warns the same thing, and I find it quite interesting that it does so both word in the Old Testament and in the New. Isaiah chapter 29, Matthew chapter 15, what do we read? These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teaching, their doctrine is but the word of man. What 1 Samuel 4 is saying is God would rather remove himself from the corrupt worship of his own people and position himself among the pagans to the point that Jeremiah is going to pick up on this text. He's going to say to them, do you remember what God was willing to do at Shiloh? Do you remember that, people? That's what's happening here. And so we ask ourselves: is Ichabod the last word? Is it the last name? And the answer is no. It's not Ichabod. It's Emmanuel. What does Zechariah say? Return to me, says the Lord, and I will return to you. You see the greatest expression of the glory of God departing. Well, it was what took place at the cross. Not here, not in Ezekiel 10. Because John tells us, here is Jesus, the Son of God incarnate. It's he who tabernacled among us. And do you remember what John says about him? We have beheld his glory. We've seen him. We've heard him. We've touched him. Therefore, the greatest Ichabod moment in all of history is what took place at the cross. The gospel writers even pick up on that. Because God's not leaving a box. He's not leaving the temple. He's leaving all of earth to the measure that Matthew says, and when he died, there was darkness that covered the land. There was no light. And yet the promise of God remained. So when your sin and my sin cries, Ichabod, what does God say? Emmanuel. He replies with grace and he says, I am with you. And don't you find it so comforting that the New Testament expression of the glory of God is in this picture of light? Isn't that what Paul is frequently saying in Colossians? Let light shine out of darkness. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so you and I can ask questions with a bit of humility and confidence. Is there Ichabod? things in your life. Things feel off. Things aren't going the way as planned. Maybe it's personal. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's church. And you say something's not right. You think the glory of God is left. What do you do? What do we do? Well, I think you first, we look inward. That's the first thing you do. Sure, the, the world loves what it should hate and hates what it should love, but we are so frequently presuming upon the grace of God that it's always a problem out there and we're never willing to look in here. What's going on in my life? Am I saying the right things, doing the right things, and yet internally just trusting in myself and saying, I have the ark though, I have the ark I'm okay. I think we look inward 
But I think the gospel also says then you look upward. You look at who God is. You behold the glory of God because he's greater than what a box can confine. And he has said, my glory is now in the presence of my spirit which dwells within you and that spirit testifies with yours that you are children of God. All because of Christ. And so you and I ask the question, where is the glory of God? It is Emmanuel. It is God with us. He is within us. And his glory is now, yes, but it's only in part. For John says there will be a day in which we will see him face to face and we will see his fullness. But until that time, I think what God has said is simple. You don't need another Benjaminite. God sends heralds to proclaim the word of God that his son has come, his son has lived, his son has died, has risen from the grave, and he has ascended to the throne of God, and he awaits the return to gather his people. And so you don't have to be concerned about a Benjamin night, a man coming and, and looking downcast. There shouldn't be heralds of the gospel with downcast faces. They don't have anything to be downcast about. They have the glory of God. It's written in the Holy Scripture that says, here he is, look at him. You can be and you can expect more of the woman at the well. Come and see the one who knew everything about me and he loved me. We wait for the glorious appearing of our blessed Savior. Not so much a glory cloud, but a glorious King who lives now and forevermore with the Father. And we await that day. In fact, if you remember well the call to worship, you keep reading in Psalm 29, what do the people cry out when they see the Word of God? They cry, glory. And we can do the same. But until then, we walk by the Spirit of God. We walk by faith. And we pray, keep us, O God, from Ichabod and draw us near to Emmanuel. Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, we are quite clear even from the garden, our sin deserves judgment. It deserves death. And yet you did not treat us as our sin deserves. You sent forth your son born of a virgin who would stoop down from the glories of heaven to the frailty of mankind and human flesh. And he would place himself under the law of God and he would die for our sin, that those who would put their hope and faith in him might be forgiven, might be made new, might in fact cry glory. And so help us this day as the people of God not to trust in things or practices, but in the person and work of Christ Jesus. Draw us to Emmanuel and keep us from Ichabod. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.